Hello and welcome to another edition of Vermont Standard Time, produced in collaboration between the Vermont Standard newspaper and Woodstock Community Television. My name is Tom Ayers, and I'm the senior staff writer with the Vermont Standard, and my guest today is Woodstock Planning and Zoning Director Stephen Bauer. We're going to be talking about the new zoning regulations that have recently been implemented in Woodstock and what they are intended to do in terms of improving the housing situation in our community. Welcome, Stephen. It's a pleasure yeah. to have you here. Well, thanks for having me, Tom. So tell, tell our listeners a little bit about the context in which this zoning regulations um, were revised, a little bit of the history of that process, and particularly what role the recently enacted Senate Bill 100 might have had in incentivizing some of these changes. Yeah. Um, so for the listeners that don't know, that this, this process kind of started about the same time that, that I came on about 18 months ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I had served as interim for a little bit when I was with Two Rivers Ottaquiche Regional Planning Commission. Uh, and that's really where this thing got launched. The legislature two sessions ago had enacted some, um, some funding for regional planning commissions and, and for towns to look into uh, bylaw modernization, specifically trying to look at how, how can we change our zoning in order to enable builders to build more housing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so it started with, uh, it, it started with that legislation that, that helped towns create a consortium. So Woodstock was actually part of a seven town consortium uh, that all was, was enacted or, or, or put together to see what zoning changes do we need to make? What modernization in order to create some more housing? Mm -hmm. um, so right about in July 2022, when I came on as the full-time uh, director for Woodstock, uh, the Planning Commission and the department kind of launched that. Um, but the foundation was already in place with with Two Rivers, and so we we started that uh, we started that process at looking at just a, a review of how is it that our current regulations were making it difficult to build housing? Um, mm -hmm. Whether that be you know, the traditional single family home or multifamily, just what are the barriers that were there? And so we started for about six, seven months looking at that and, and talking through that and bringing in different, different groups. Um, and then the next legislative session started and that is where this S-100 which you know enacted as Act 47 uh, came into play, okay. and so we were we were already halfway through this review and kind of looking at new language when the legislature said, "Look, we like what we did. We like where you're going. Not just Woodstock, but other towns that were looking at mm -hmm. this." Mm -hmm. But they said, "Some of these things are so important that we need to require them now," and so that's what really pushed it from okay, well. We're working on this, and we're getting closer and closer, and we're drafting language to, we need to have this done uh, immediately. Mm -hmm. And so that's where, uh, so S-100, once enacted, most of the things that are critical to zoning reform, mm -hmm. they went into effect as of July 1, 2023. And what are some of, uh, just some of those central tenets of, of Senate? Can you kind of give a broad overview of what some of the major things that are now required? Yeah, so, so one of the major things, uh, it, it's all kind of geared, the purpose of, of S-100 was to, was to really uh, allow for higher density. Mm -hmm. So one of those examples is that um, taking from, one, single family houses um, to not, from eliminating where you can have zones where ex that exclude any other duplex, triplex, or, or further, mm -hmm. uh, they said, we need to stop that. That's mm -hmm. exclusionary. We're excluding a certain group of people, um, only the folks that can that can purchase and afford a single family home. Okay. And so they said anywhere, anywhere that has uh, you know, any zoning district, uh, you have a single family and you have to allow duplexes. The good news was Woodstock was already doing that. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, mm -hmm. you know, we're we're so we were so far behind in other ways, and in other ways we looked. We looked progressive uh, ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. um, in other in other ways, the size of lots. So the other big thing that that S100 did is it said, look, if you have the capability 
as a, as a town or, or a neighborhood, you're able to connect to uh, sewer and water, then a town can't, town can't create zoning that, that prohibits density higher than five units per acre. Uh, mm. So what that essentially says is, uh, you know, even throughout the village, we have, you know, the, traditionally we have uh, re residential one acre, which means uh, you have to have one acre in order to build for mm -hmm. each unit mm -hmm. or each duplex. Uh, we have residential three acre, which doesn't have a lot of housing currently in the mm -hmm. village. And so it created, it, it creates this, this large lot scenario where you have to have a lot of land in order to add additional units. And so that's, that's great and part of the character of the, of the neighborhood as we know it with zoning. So you, you kind of have this history of pre-zoning and up to 1970 and then you have this kind of post-zoning mm -hmm. world. And so that's what we really looked at um, in, and I think that's what the legislature did as well mm -hmm. is really looking at uh, what did it look like before we even had zoning. Um, and recognizing that we have such a high demand for housing that maybe we should take some of those things and, and implement them into the zoning code now. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where for each unit, um, pretty much throughout the entire village, um, your now minimum density is 8,712 square feet. Um, so that's what S100 did mm -hmm. uh, to try mm -hmm. and create, you know, where we already have the infrastructure, focus on building more housing where the infrastructure already exists. Absolutely, I totally get it. Um, so the Planning Commission looked at, at five areas, and we'll get to those, but they talked about three major focuses uh, in terms of the uh, zoning regulations, and, and they'll be enacted the end of the 30-day period is coming up, is it not? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's 20 days, so on the 21st days. day, which actually I believe was November 1st, so ah, they, are, okay. they are currently effective. They are effective, okay. Yep. Uh, I wanted to get some clarity there to make sure that uh, there wasn't still the possibility that yep. someone would look to put it on the ballot next town meeting day or whatever. Yep. So the three major focuses identified by the Planning Commission, uh, let's take them one by one. First is parking. What mm -hmm. changes have been made in zoning regulations relative mm -hmm. to parking in the village? Yep. Uh, so this is one of those things that, that we had been talking about before when S100 came down and became law is uh, we had previously required two resident, for each residential unit, two parking spaces. Uh, so as we know, a typical parking space is an 18, uh, 18 by 9. Uh, we require 250 square feet uh, for turnaround space for each parking space. So um, what that means is rather than adding additional units, we've required a lot of the space in our condensed village to require more parking. And so the legislature looked at that and, and agreed and said, look, that's too much space going towards parking. We need to reserve some of that for, for housing. Mm -hmm. um, and so they said, look, <laughs> so S100 came down and said, um, you, you can't require more than one parking space per, per mm -hmm. residential unit. Mm -hmm. um, so in the, in the process of looking at it, the Planning Commission considered anywhere from do we have certain zone B, you know, say zero parking required um, to saying, you know, one. And we landed on sticking with the legislature and saying in all districts of the village, uh, one parking space is required. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and so a lot of that comes in because there's still some transitions and we'll talk a little bit more about that, I think. Uh, later is is the infrastructure of of a concern of where where if we add several more you know if we add hundreds of more units where are people going to park when we have our busiest times like foliage and and so we're we're still working through some Absolutely. of uh, that and and we'll bring in some of that that you know, the market to help us understand that. So just to be clear, if a let's say a large home is split into a duplex. Mm -hmm then you can require no more than two. Yep, so it's just one parking space per unit. Per unit. So yep. quadplex would be four and yep. so on. Yep. Got it. And okay. so we went actually beyond just that regulation and said, look, if there are areas, you know, because what we'd like to see is a more walkable downtown. Absolutely. And so uh, we also included certain provisions for 
uh, if you're building a multifamily unit, especially if you're building multifamily that includes some affordable housing units, mm -hmm. and you can meet that definition of an affordable development, um, well, maybe those people don't necessarily want a car. Um, and so, uh, so in the idea of making it more walkable, what mm -hmm. we said is, is uh, as we said, um, less, you can have, if you can have shared parking elsewhere, uh, mm -hmm. there's a way that you can get a waiver for, for mm -hmm. not requiring one parking per unit. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. anyways, there that's, that's yeah. another way that we, that we looked at parking. Absolutely. Um, let's touch then on the issue of density, which is, all of this is inter, uh, is very interconnected, yeah. obviously, um, by, by, uh, Reducing the, uh, the the parking requirement, you're creating the opportunity for more infill yeah. fill development, and that's mm -hmm. what density is all about, obviously. Yeah. So, so um, what changes were made to um, to deal with the density issue in the new regs? Yeah. So I think you, you you pretty much hit the idea of what is density. That just means how much land is required per how many units you can build. Mm -hmm. And we did a survey. This is even before. The legislature went and looked at S100, and we looked at it and he said, okay, well, we have some very small lots within the village, but we also have some, you know, four or five acre lots. Um, and so we put that all together and said, look, the average lot size, even within the village, the most condensed, you know, traditionally dense area, we still have an average of over half an acre of land per one unit. We said, we can put some more on there. Um, and so, and that's not meaning that people have to do it. We're just no. saying, look, we have some land to infill where we already have water, mm -hmm. we already have sewer, um, we already have a demand for where people want to live. And so uh, what we looked at is what is the current density and what happens uh, you know, if we, if one, this is before S100 even mm -hmm. came down, we said, mm -hmm. okay, we're, we need to reduce to be able to put more units specifically in the village. Uh, it's the most desirable area to live. Um, and it's also in an effort to try and keep the rural character of the area outside of the village more mm -hmm. rural. Mm -hmm. um, so we looked at all that density and pretty much we've, we've come to the conclusion that not everyone will do this, but we make it, we enable people to build, you know, up to five units in an R1, a residential one acre area. Uh, for the residential low acre area, it's the same thing. We just require less and less land the, the, the closer you get to the village center. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So and then when you get to the village center, you go, look, we just need, we need as much housing, as many units as you can pretty much put in there. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So. That, that's essentially the idea. As you get closer to that kind of walkability criteria, we say you need less and less land. Mm -hmm. So that's, what, that's how the density has changed. And that could be a combination of either um, new construction or uh, renovation and reinvention of existing. Exactly. Um, uh, adding an, AD, an accessory dwelling unit or yep. maybe even a tiny house or a cottage in the yeah. backyard of yeah. a lot. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's really the beauty of the village is because you have an idea of, uh, you have that historic, you know, thinking about, you know, apartments above the, the hardware store or mm -hmm. the, you know, you have a restaurant on the, on the f you know, back in the 1800s, we had, you know, the people that ran the restaurant or the coffee shop. You know, they lived upstairs in the apartment uh, and they might have their employees there. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> funny enough, in in now the 21st century, we're seeing a lot more of that desire. Mm -hmm. um, I want to live where I work. I don't necessarily want a 20, 30, or an hour long commute. Right. Um, and so we're, we're trying to, we're almost copying off of what was, what naturally happened uh, and putting that in a zoning code that, that makes that a reality again. And is the expectation that um, a lot of this, are we targeting a certain economic sector in terms of expanding that. So we hear a lot of talk about workforce housing and, yeah. and uh, workforce housing basically means just that, housing for yeah. essential workers. Um, 
One of the issues that has been talked about in Woodstock for a long time is that people who work here can't afford to live here. So is that an incentive for this kind of development? Yeah, and I think yeah. that's that's something that the Planning Commission and, and through all these conversations and uh, discussions that, w that we had over time is that you know, housing, you can't really talk about the, the economics of your village without looking at housing. Mm -hmm. um, the availability of housing is an economic driver. Um, so when you think about you know, wanting to go out to eat on a Tuesday night or, or even a Thursday night, um, how many restaurants are there? And you go, okay, well, there's this many restaurants. Well, how, you know, what is their, their work availability? And we're not, we're not only seeking to bring people that would work at a restaurant, but we're also seeking people that might work at, you know, other regional areas. School teachers, so police school officers, teachers, police officers, nurses, uh, nurses people yeah. that work for Dartmouth. Um, right. So, right. So we look at all of this economic factor, and S100 definitely, definitely focuses on uh, providing bonuses for people that are building affordable developments. Um, but we're... We looked at that and we looked beyond and say, mm -hmm. okay, um, what does it actually take? What what is it in a what makes Woodstock affordable? Mm -hmm. um, and that can go clear up to, you know, a familial income of almost one hundred fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars of someone who's looking to buy and move and raise a family in this area. And you start to think, okay. We're talking anywhere from people that make a median uh, the whatever the, the median income for Windsor County, all the way up to almost double that. And so we're considering all of that and saying, look, if we make it easier to build housing in general, then we'll be able to attract and retain more of those people mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. rather than uh, only attracting and retaining people that are, that are of the top you know, one to 3% in income. Mm -hmm. How much does the fact that and I believe the figure, you would probably know better than I, I believe the figure is somewhere around 60% of the housing in the village is owned by second or second homeowners or out-of-state homeownership. Is that correct, roughly? Yeah, I'd say it, it's, it's probably, I don't know the exact percentage, but it, it, it's... Somewhere in that area. Yeah, somewhere so, around half. Is the hope that those folks will step up and look at, because that's a sizable number, of, of the housing stock that is um, not primary residential, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's that's one of the factors. I think because of just the nature of what Woodstock is, mm -hmm. I think it's going to continue to be an economic driver and a reality that, you know, it's, it's a beautiful place. Right. And so maybe someone can't, you know, maybe a, a, a homeowner can't live here full time, but they still want to retain that second home or they inherited a second home. Right. Um, you know, for whatever reason, we, we understand that that's still going to be a, a reality. That's still right. a part right. uh, a part of it, uh, and and we don't want to shame that. We don't want to say that well no. that's just inherently bad because we don't think it is. Uh, what we're saying is that um, where we can infill with more families that that are here full time or mm -hmm. here the majority of the time, mm -hmm. um, you know, we think that that will start to welcome people that have bought a second home or own a second home and say, man, maybe Woodstock is the place. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe we don't maybe we transition from that being our, our primary home mm -hmm. uh, rather than a secondary home because Woodstock is offering all of this, you know, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. all these different yeah. things and yeah. and so sure. That sure. that is a that's a hope. It's it's hope it's not necessarily the, what was the goal of these changes, but okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, let's move on to the third focus area and that is um, broadly under the heading of timeli timeliness in right. terms of the permitting process, which of course you're at the, at the center <laughs> of. Yep. Um, and um, uh, there's an administrative process, then there's the conditional use process. Yep. And, and we're throwing around some terminology here that you and I both understand. Y yeah. What do those, f for the listeners uh, and the viewers, w what do those mean in terms of what the zoning regulations have changed as far as the process and permitting is concerned? Yeah, so this is a little bit of, of the town zone, you know, the Planning Commission's idea, um, but also in S100 as well, saying that part of the, part of the purpose is to just how do, we, how do we reduce the amount of time if someone, you know, you come to me and say, look, I've got a contractor ready, I want to build a house, it's this moderate house, and, you know, I'm, I'm ready to build it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, which 
I'm pretending that that's an easy process in itself right now. That itself is not an easy yeah, process absolutely. today. So we're recognizing that, look, you have enough things to deal with. Um, why have to go through multiple processes when we're trying to attract people to build more housing? Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of those are, you know, if, if you were to copy and paste and build the same house that you were building, you know, next door, and you say, well, we're going to make it look exactly the same, but we're going to put, th we're going to divide it so there's three units. Well, we determined that, that was a multifamily unit because mm -hmm. um, once you got over three or more was multifamily. Mm -hmm. So the average time of conditional use permit is somewhere between 60 and 90 days. Mm -hmm. So by the time, you know, by the time you secure funding and secure your contractor and secure all the things and come to the permitting and say, okay, we're going to build this thing and we're going to add three new units. You go, well, there's three, sometimes even more, three to four months in between from when you're ready to build it to when you actually get the permit <clears throat> and are legally able to build it. And that's it's, going through the development review and that's, process. Yep. And, yeah. yeah. So we looked at that and said, the same way as the state did, and said that that's way too long. Um, so one of the fundamental changes that we made is up to, you hit that, that same point at five units. So we say, if you hit five units or more, okay, that's that's a larger scale development, mm -hmm. but if you're at four or less, that just goes through an administrative review process, and that which means is in your office, which is as opposed which is just to going yep through the whole TDRB or village yeah. development review. So yeah. so an average review process, and, and you still walk through all the same things. Um, so it's still you know if it it still has to hit meet all the setbacks. It still has to sure. you know if it's on a steep slope, it's still you know it might go to a different board, but. But the point being is, is if all those things check out, what we're doing is taking a three to four month timeline and turning it into a three to four week timeline. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what changing to an administrative process can do. Okay, excellent, excellent. I want to touch on two other um, areas that were a focus of the Planning Commission, uh, although not in these three major focus yep. areas. And those are um, water and sewer, and um, and general growth planning, yeah. looking ahead. Um, water and sewer. We talked. You and I talked about this a little bit last week when I interviewed you. Um, uh, infrastructure and the inf interface mm -hmm. between infrastructure and um, these sort of uh, plans to try and develop up. Uh, there's an interface there mm -hmm. that the the town and the community needs to come to grips with. What what does that mean in terms of water and sewer? Yeah. So the the so we let me back up for a second. Okay. So all all five of these uh, came out of this process before S one hundred. Okay. Um, and I credit um, they're credited a lot to the economic development uh, housing group, mm -hmm. and so they're really the ones that highlighted and said like these are the five. They, we've taken surveys. We've looked at all this. This is what you need to look at during this right. process. Right. This is out of the economic development commission. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so. This one particular comes out because the harsh reality of zoning doesn't build any housing. Right. Zoning itself is is just, you know, it's a process. We're making it easier. We're eliminating barriers. Right. But zoning doesn't build a single house. Um, right. You need people, you need developers, you need you need construction workers. You need you need, you need all of that to come together to and, actually. And, and it doesn't build a public water system or a bingo. wastewater treatment facility yep. yeah. either. Right? So, so we can have all the demand in the world, and we can have the regulations go through and say, "Look, it's it's an automatic yes. You just sure. all you have to do is come to our office, get a permit. Yeah. We yeah. love it. Uh, there's still a lot of things that you have to do, and so what came out is is in that like. In, in the study that says, look, we need 500 new units. As of yesterday, we, we need 500 new units. Mm -hmm. uh, you go, okay, great. Um, we've still got to ask, how much capacity do we have? Do we have the capacity to put on 500 units? Um, we're going through a process of where we're looking at, because the state has said, you've got to look at replacing your wastewater treatment plant. And so we've got to look at, <coughs> is that, you know, is that what we're, you know, is is that investment that we need to make? Uh, if we if we need 500, can we handle a thousand? You know, what what do we even need to do infrastructure wise, mm -hmm. uh, and where are those going to go, and how are we going to handle it? So that's another thing that we're 
you know, we highlight it as, well, that's not going to be just a quick conversation. Right. Uh, if the zoning laws themselves took, um, you know, 18 months to get to get through, um, that's just another thing that we've highlighted and said, look, this is this is going to be something that we have to really look at. And as the world works in July, when the, the main water line broke, you go, okay, well, we start looking at, you know, what are the benefits, cost analysis, and that's what there's a committee looking at right now. Sure, uh, absolutely. And so we're in the beginning processes of, okay, we've created, we've eliminated or reduced some of these barriers. Um, when people come in the office and say, look, I would like to put up 10 units. I now have the availability as the administrative officer to say, well, I think we can actually make that work uh, via the law. Mm -hmm. Where before, we might have just said, well, no, sorry. Let's just mm -hmm. stop here because the, the regulations say no. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what we've done so far, but then looking at the other things that we need in order to make that a reality. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what, that's what kind of uh, the water infrastructure sewer is all looking at. I was just reading this morning, uh, uh, turning to another um, infrastructure issue, I was just reading this morning um, about uh, a nationwide discussion that's now happening among, um, particularly among public utility commissions and, yeah. and interfacing with the federal government about the need for a complete reinvention and overhaul of the U.S. power grid. Yeah. And that's an issue here as well, yeah. um, not uh, much the same as water and sewer issues or problems nationwide, the, or issues nationwide, the question of providing electric power. Yeah. And, and um, I, I talked with w one of your, um, well, uh, I think perhaps possibly even your successor at <laughs> yeah. uh, Two Rivers out of Quichi, uh, Jeff Grout, um, who's their intermunicipal uh, energy coordinator. Uh, and um, the whole notion, and we've got these going in in Randolph, my hometown, the whole notion of developing microgrids in yeah. villages and integrating renewable resources and generating power where it's needed at the local level. Is that something that Woodstock's begun having conversations about? Um, so, so not really in, in depth um, yeah. Yeah. at this point. Um, yeah. I, I think it's it's something it's something that's that's in there. Uh, we continue to have conversations on, on the fringe, um, but it's 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 complicated. Yeah. And when you yeah. get into utilities, it, it it's complicated. It takes a long time. There's a lot of people involved. Right. Um, so that's where even coming back to some of the things you know you mentioned those out of those first five, you have the first three. We saw those as those are the things that we have immediate control over. Absolutely. Um, that we we go through, and then and then we had the legislature say, well, yeah, you have control over them, and we're demanding that you do this. Yeah. Um, so not demanding, requiring that you do this. Yeah. And so we looked at at the five, those big five, and said, okay, all these are going to require some conversation, but these are the kind of the low hanging fruit that we have actual control over. When we're talking about water, town doesn't currently own the water company. Uh, when we're talking about sewer, okay, we own we own the, the wastewater treatment plant, um, but we don't know the capacity of, of truly what we'll need. So mm -hmm. we need to look at that. So we've got some questions there, but right. you know, at least we have control or authority over that. And then you have Green Mountain Power, who supplies the power here. And you go, okay, well, we don't own Green Mountain Power and I don't think they're for sale. Um, and then they have their own regulatory you know, process that they go through. Exactly. Um, yeah. So it's it's something that we, we rely heavily on the Regional Planning Commission and, and Jeff and and previously Jeff Martin who I had worked Jeff with who Martin, was who was right. the yes, the yes. previous uh, IREC. Um, so it's something that we worked on very close together and I mm -hmm. think you know the Regional Planning mm -hmm. Commissions are continuing to work and it's going to be something that's going to come before the legislature again. Uh, I mean the the federal government provided all this funding to look at things like what's our grid problems and what are we going to do about it. Mm -hmm. um, we just don't have the solution yet. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, it's part of that whole puzzle. So all of this uh, that you've just outlined falls under the fifth um, area of concern that the Planning Commission uh, illuminated, which is just general growth planning. This is all yep. part, of, part and parcel of that. You 
just returned from uh, the New England Regional Planning um, Association meeting, um, literally yesterday, if yeah. I recall yeah. correctly. And um, uh, these topics were front and center. These very same topics were front and center among yeah. all your colleagues from yeah. the three uh, yeah. northern New England states. Yeah, I, I would say uh, the way I'd put it is the harsh reality of Woodstock is not unique at all mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to the things that we're facing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think there's, there's, a, there's a good thing in that bad news. Um, right. Because when you're talking about the, the northern New England uh, planning conferences is, is yeah. where we're at. Yeah. Um, you know, we were having a lot of conversations with a lot of different towns that are going through similar things and all looking at them differently. Mm -hmm. um, so, again, where we started is, is, is you have three states between Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine that all look really great because they have, you know, even though we get a lot of rain, uh, it's, it's still temperate yeah. climate, uh, low population, um, and, you know, even though we've got an El Nino year and who knows what the snow will be, uh, it, they're great places to live. Right. So naturally, we're seen as a desirable pa place to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and so... I think the the reality that we're looking at is is populations are going to increase. People are coming here, whether we want them or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and the work that we're doing now is how far do we get ahead of that in order to be welcoming and accommodate, um, you know, without changing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the big fear. Mm -hmm. Is uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's what planning is really meant to do. Mm -hmm. Is is how can we retain our sense of place, which is really what Woodstock is known for. Absolutely. How do we keep Woodstock Woodstock, Absolutely. but also be, be able to accommodate and welcome uh, new folks that you know match all our all our criteria absolutely and, and yeah. we'll really appreciate Woodstock for what it is yeah that's a great point to end on Stephen yeah. I really appreciate um, uh, every opportunity to speak with you and I appreciate this opportunity to let our viewers know about the zoning changes that are uh, now in effect and how those are going to affect the character of Woodstock and the availability of housing um, uh, for future generations. Thanks yeah. so much for being yeah. with us today. Well, thank you, Tom.